following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. are in Matthew chapter 7, and if you look uh, in your Bible or electronic device that has a Bible on it, and you, do, you don't have a Bible, uh, right in front of you in the pews, there's Bibles there. You can go ahead and open it. You're going to see um, a black heading over top of the words of Scripture, and it's going to say the golden rule. Now, um, the Bible and those headings, that's not the inspired word of God. Uh, it's just for our benefit, okay? So when we look at those headings, we just realize that somebody put those in there to kind of help us understand. Same with the big numbers and the little numbers, okay? Big numbers being the chapters, smaller number being the verses, just helps us kind of understand what what the Bible is trying to say in its context. Now you'll see uh, right there in that bold heading it says uh, the golden rule. And the golden rule is really interesting. It is a principle on how we should treat other people the way that you would want to be treated. Now this is found in pretty much every other religion and culture all over the world. You will find it all over the place and it's not quote unquote new in regards to the New Testament. As a matter of fact, Jesus is going to summarize something that has already been proclaimed and declared way back in Leviticus chapter 19. And he is going to summarize it because it is a rule or a principle that started with God and then other people have kind of taken it and said what they want to say about it. So in the Babylonian time period, about 1700 years before Jesus shows up on the scene, uh, the Babylonians adopted this same rule and concept. And then you you have Confucius, who shows about 500 years earlier before Jesus shows up on scene, and he talks about it. Then you get into the New Testament, you realize Jesus talks about it, Buddha talks about it, Hindus talk about it, Jews talk about it, Taoists talk about it, and the rest of the world's major religions talk about it. If you were to Google the golden rule, you'll see that 143 major religious leaders got together and they essentially formatted a document of, called the Declaration Towards Gl Global Ethic. And they said that this is a concept that no religion in misses entirely. But ready for this? Belief in God isn't necessarily necessary to practice. So secular people adopt this and so do spiritual people, but what makes it so different when Jesus declares it? That's our whole goal, that's our whole kind of, uh, M, uh, what do you call it, uh, mission objective, MO, that's our whole MO today, is to understand why it's so different when Jesus starts to unpack it and articulate it for us. And how is it separate from the rest of the world's face or religions or even societies? So before we go any further, let me just ask God's blessing upon his word, and then we'll look at it and we'll see if we can understand it. Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth, and thank you for a place where your truth is proclaimed, and thank you that you are sovereign over the church, and that you've been uh, working in and through broken vessels like myself from generation to generation to generation, and every word that you have so clearly put on these pages is useful for teaching and for training, and it proves true, and we just thank you before we go any further for your word. And we thank you for the opportunity to study it and that people aren't pushing down our doors today trying to get in here to persecute us through violence. And we thank you that you shield us and you tell us that we should study this. And we know that we do fall short of your glory and your standard. And so sometimes we're not clear in how we should apply this to our everyday lives. So God, today, just speak through a very broken vessel like myself. Help me to be clear Help me to teach this truth um, the way that you taught it way back on the Sermon on the Mount. And may it be your words and not mine. And may we not just be puffed up with knowledge in implementing these truths, but may we apply them appropriately in our marriages, in our relationships, with our kids, with our grandkids, with uh, the people that we interact with uh, every single day. May these... Uh, this truth really resound in us today that is not an easy path to take, but it's, it's quite difficult, but we can do things 
that honor and glorify you when we have obtained the power of the Holy Spirit. When we confess that we're sinners and believe that you are the Savior, you're the Messiah who came, died, and rose again. So God, help us to, uh, to understand and implement today and help me to be clear. It's in your name that I pray, amen. All right, Matthew chapter seven, he says this. Matthew chapter seven, um, verse 12. So, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. 13, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it, they are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard, and that leads to life, but very few find it. Back to verse 12. In the previous verses, because we have to understand scripture in context. Verse goes to chapter, chapter goes uh, to book, book goes to genre, and genre just means like gospels, there's four of them, letters, there's multiples of them, um, things like that, okay? Goes to gospel, or goes to genre, genre goes to testament, Old or New Testament, testament goes to book. That's how you understand scripture, okay? It's in a whole. And in the previous verses in Matthew, Jesus speaks about a person's relationship that they have with God, namely asking, seeking, and knocking. And now Christ, in the conclusion of his sermon, is going to push into us what's already been stated and say, this is how you're going to implement these truths with the interactions that you have every day with your fellow human beings. Now, many translations don't put a link between verse 11 and verse 12, but it is very important that we understand that. That word so is critical and crucial to us as we unpack this truth because it connects everything that Jesus has already said. So, Jesus is saying, if you've truly accepted me as Savior and desire to live in conformity to my will, not your own will, then do this. And he gives us two very simple, basic commands that are very difficult to live out if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Number one, that you would love unselfishly. The first thing that Jesus tells us in verse 12 is, I want you to love unselfishly. Well, the golden rule can be found in all forms all over the place. This is how it's usually communicated. The golden rule is usually communicated in a very negative way. And then I'll explain what that means. In other words, they would say, don't do to others what you wouldn't like to do them to do to you. You ever done this with your, with your kids? Okay. They slug their sister. And maybe this is just my house, not your house. All right. And you look at them. And what's the first thing out of your mouth? Would you like it if your sister hits you? No, then don't do it to them, right? That's negative because it's selfish. You're essentially saying that I don't want that to happen to me, so I'm not going to do it to you. And what we see here in the text is Jesus, while debated, he is one of the first people to flip a negative statement into a positive form. In other words, what he's saying, whatever you wish of others, you do for them, expecting nothing in return. You would do for that person out of the kindness and goodness of your heart not to get anything out of that individual. So Jesus doesn't say you do this so you can get this. He says you do this so that you can serve me, love me, honor me because I've done that for you. Where? Jesus died on the cross for our sin. His blood was sufficient for the entire world but only efficient for those who would believe. Jesus knew full well that there was a possibility that the entire world would reject his blood sacrifice but he did it anyway. Why? Because God so loved the world. Agape love, unconditional love, not expecting anything in return. He just did this because he cares for us. So whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So let's look at that little uh, sentence and see what Jesus says about us who are supposed to be his disciples. Well, he says, whatever you wish. Now, One of the things I love about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is these verses show up all over the place, okay? So in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, it shows up in Luke chapter 6, verse 11. Now, here's the crazy thing. In Matthew, Jesus has already articulated this big, long sermon on the mount. He's saying, hey, if you want to be my disciple, you live this way, you act this way, you do these things. In Luke, Luke tells us to do these things to avoid the wrath of God. There's woes. There's four woes that Luke has already articulated in his text. Now, Matthew's writing to Jews, and he wants the Jews to reject their old sinful ways and come to follow this Messiah, this Savior. 
But what we realize here in Luke is that Luke speaks mostly to a Gentile audience. And so he says, all of you doubters, you should come into the family of God and you should have the opportunity to do what he wants you to do so that you can avoid his wrath. The command here is, if you do these things, crisis can be avoided and blessing can be obtained. So I ask myself, for how long do I have to do these things, right? I mean, any good child will ask, for how long do I have to make my bed? How long do I have to dust? How long do I have to vacuum? So long as it's called today. (laughs) That word whatever there, if you want to circle that, is in a reference to the extent of time. Jesus essentially says, as long as you live, you get to act this way. Isn't that a blessing? You get to be like Jesus for the rest of your life. Now, one you desire is one word, meaning what you want strongly of others. And it's, re- it's referencing our fellow sinful human beings. So how do you, as Christ's disciple, ready? What do you want for other human beings? Well, we want two things as disciples of Christ. Number one, we want people to confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. We want them to come into the family of God through faith, not by works. We want them to understand the gospel. Christ came, died, and rose again. What do we want for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? We want them to be edified and encouraged. We want them to be built up. And so what Jesus is saying here is, he says, if that's the case, then you should act like Christ because Jesus is perfect. And so you too should be perfect. You should strive for that perfection. And I thought about this and I thought, man, who doesn't want to be treated perfectly, right? Who doesn't want to be uh, loved unconditionally, valued highly, listened to often? Every time you open your mouth, man, that you would listen or that somebody would listen to you. Whatever you wish other people would do, you do for them. Not so that you could have, but so that you could give. And ready for this church? The more you give, the, more, the less selfish you become. The less selfish you become the more like Jesus you are. And what he says here is, I want you to think about how your life would change if you were to act this way. For example, all right, let's talk about it in a uh, general life context. You wake up in the morning, you come downstairs, and you look at the dishwasher, if you're blessed to have one, and you say, I can't believe he will not empty the dishwasher. How hard is it? You just open the door, you pull out things, you put the dishes away, it's easy. Now, some of you women are saying, I hope my husband never empties the dishwasher because the plates will be where the bowls are, the bowls will be where everything else is. Like, that would be disastrous. And for you, you just put another illustration in there. I wish he would do this. I wish she would do this. Now, I want you to examine your motives on why you do those things. Because I think, if you were to really be honest, You would say, I do those things so that I can get something else in return. I do those things so that I can get something else in return, right? Women, sometimes you look at it and you go, I just want to be valued. I just want to be hugged. I just want to be held. I just want want him to tell me that I'm pretty and I'm worth it. Well, guess what? Why don't you wrap your arms around him and tell him he's pretty and he's worth it and see what happens there, okay? Talk about this in regards to parenting. So many of us look at our kids and we go, our kids are always on the phone. I wish they would get off the phone. Well, guess what? You want to know how to get your kids off the phone? Get off your own stupid phone. Okay? More is caught than taught. So maybe, just maybe, your son or your daughter is watching what you're doing instead of listening to what you're saying. And so what we realize here is we don't do that so that they'll give something to me. We do that because I desire it for them. Uh, Some of you who are older, right? You wish your kids would come and visit you. You say all the time, you say, I mean, I just wish they would come visit sometimes. I mean, they're not busy. They only have seven kids running around. They're not busy at all. They can come visit me whenever they want. Well, hold on a second, okay? Why don't you go visit them, all right? I know sometimes that's unobtainable. It doesn't happen. But think about how much different life would be. And do it this week. Start writing some of this stuff down. Think to yourself, every time you say, I wish my wife, my husband, my coworker, my boss, My kids, my mom, my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, whatever the case is, you write that down and think to yourself, am I doing that myself? Am I doing that? Am I participating in that? Am I the one who is doing these things? Man, I think if you start doing what you want other people to do to you, your whole life will change, but you have to expect nothing in response. Jesus essentially says, if you desire or want what I've said, you want to obtain these things. 
these beatitudes, right? If you want to do these specific things, you want to obtain these specific things, then the more you extend yourself, the more you will receive something from God. The more you serve with your hands, the more you'll realize the blessing of the Lord. Men and women of God are used by God in the service for God in evangelism and edification. Paul will tell Timothy, he will say, Timothy, this is how you fight the good fight. This is how you fight the good fight. This, Timothy, is how you will be complete. The more you extend yourself, the more you will think less of yourself. And the more your congregation will be built up. You desire that people get saved? Awesome. Start opening your mouth and talking about it. <laughs> and let me just tell you something. I fall short of this all the time, okay? I don't have all this figured out. <laughs> I'll never forget, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a young man was walking by our church. He was an Amazon driver that was in his own personal car. He's walking by our church, and he ends up at our church, and he says, uh, the police department took my car. I said, okay. And he says, uh, they took my car, and um, I, I don't have it anymore, obviously. And I said, uh, that's too bad. What do, what do you need? He said, I need a phone charger to be able to call uh, for a ride. And I said, did you walk from Bremen? He's like, yeah, absolutely. I said, whoa, it's kind of cold out there. And this is before the weather decided to be all weird about us and not figure out if it's fall or winter. <clears throat> so it was still cold. And so I looked at him and I realized that his phone was going to take forever to charge. And he's going to be an inconvenience in my life. So I said, hey, I'll tell you what. I'll just drive you wherever you want to go. He said, are you serious? I said, absolutely. I said, I'm just letting you know right now, I'm part of the police department, so if you do anything to me, I'll kill you. <laughs> he said, fair enough. Annette laughed, and we took off. <laughs> we got all the way to where he was going in South Bend. I dropped him off, and uh, as I was turning the corner, I thought to myself, I didn't share the gospel with that guy. What's wrong with me? So even I fail in this sometimes, okay? Even, even, like, sometimes this is hard. I wish somebody who had given me a ride would share the gospel with me on why they did it. I should have given them the reason why I gave them a ride, but I didn't. Sometimes we fall short on this, okay? But just because we fall short on these things doesn't mean that we don't fulfill doing these things. You're going to fall short. You're going to fall short on some of these things, and that's okay because you fall seven times, you get up eight, and so here Jesus says, if you want to be edified, you edify somebody else. And you'll realize that Christ can do things for you that other people can't. You'll have an action of unselfish extension that will lead to an obtained internal desire. You will find the more you extend your hands and your feet that those selfish tendencies just go away and godliness starts to come in. It is not a reaching in which is selfish, it's a reaching out. And Jesus says, I want you to do these things. Why? Why would he say that? Well, it's interesting. Look at the very last point of that verse. He says, whatever you wish that somebody would do for you, do for them. Do, do this for them. Full extension. And then he says something interesting. He says, for the law and the prophets hang. The word there is hang on these things. Now, I told you that this verse is all over the place in the Bible, okay? It's in Matthew and it's in Luke, but it's also in Matthew again in chapter 22. And it's listed right in the great commandment. What is the great commandment? Somebody was really smart, they asked Jesus, said, Jesus, um, what's the greatest commandment? Let's just fulfill that one, right? Let's just do one. And I think I would have asked that question. He says, it's easy. He says, you love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. <laughs> okay, Jesus, real easy, right? And he says, and if you love uh, the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you might as well love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? My neighbor is anybody who has a need in which I am able to meet. Think about that in your everyday life. Your wife can be your neighbor, your husband can be your neighbor, your kids can be your neighbor, your aunt and uncle can be your neighbor, your coworker can be your neighbor, your actual neighbor can be your neighbor. And in the great commandment, it says that we should do these things, all of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the teachings of the prophets are based on these two specific commandments. So when you are extending yourself, doing for others, not to receive something from them, but to show them the love of God, you are fulfilling the great commandment, which is you are loving God wholeheartedly and you are loving your neighbor as yourself. So what Jesus essentially says is, if you do to others what I have done or will do because he's gonna die on the cross, you're living this out and you're in line with God's will. The more we extend ourselves, the more we're in line with God's will. So the people who are far from God would come to know God through faith in Christ, and people who have a faith in Christ would understand 
what it means to be built up and encouraged. And Jesus models this in everything he does from here on out because he fulfills the law and the prophets in those things. Watch how Jesus conducts himself through the whole whole entire gospels. He extends himself. He extends himself all the time and he makes sure that people understand this. This is how you will be full. If you ever feel like your life is missing something, it might be just maybe, just maybe, is because you are too concerned about yourself and not concerned about somebody else. The times in our life when we get anxious, when we get nervous, when we get upset is because most of the time we want something instead of striving after what God wants. One um, New Testament rabbi said, following the golden rule keeps the rest of God's commands. Now, pause for a second. You cannot do this if you do not have the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible. It is 100% impossible to do this if you are not a child of God. You cannot love somebody unselfishly if you are not a child of God. It's impossible. You want to know why? Because you're sinful human beings. After all of this, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus through faith, you will do whatever you want to do because that's your sinful bent. You will go against everything that God says until you submit to what God does. And he dies on the cross for our sins so that you can submit to him. Only a child of God can live and act this way through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now here's what's interesting. Paul understands this. And in Ephesians, he talks about this, which is really interesting. Ephesians talks about the walk. So if we were to essentially just summarize everything in Ephesians, we would realize that Paul talks about walking with God through faithful obedience. And then we get into Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, and he says this, which is interesting. This is a prayer for the church in Ephesus. It might as well be the prayer for community gospel. It is a prayer, bold heading, for spiritual strength in living out this command. He says, for this reason, in culmination, I bow my knees before the Father. Now notice Paul is extending himself to the church and he wants what's best for them. From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. For all people, I desire these things. 16, that according to the riches of his glory that God freely gave to us, understanding that we would fall short of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. That you would be renewed internally the more externally you are actively seeking to obey him. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you may be rooted and grounded in love. All Paul's prayer here is an extension of giving, not in receiving. Because we have received from God, now we freely give. That you may have strength to comprehend this with all the saints. The breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. When you do these things, Paul essentially says, you will know the love of Christ that surpasses your knowledge and that you will be filled with the fullness of God. Now, unto him, Jesus, who is able to do far more abundantly than we could think or imagine according to his power that is at work with us. Isn't that amazing? Paul essentially prays for the Ephesian church that they would be so proactive in unselfishly loving others that the love of God would be full in them. Whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them. So take inventory this morning as we're talking through this and just think, maybe this past week, what have you desired that other people do? Are you doing that for them? What do you desire that other people do? Are you doing that for them? And God lay burdens on your heart and he will say you will grow and mature in your relationship with Christ the more you participate in doing those things, expecting nothing in return. Now, as I was studying this passage of scripture, I thought to myself, okay, that makes sense. I think I understand that, Jesus. I need some help uh, there, obviously, with the application side. But how in the world does 12 tie in with 13 and 14? Because if you notice, they're together. How does this tie together? Like this doesn't seem like these are two of the same things. Because in verse 13, he says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I realized is, whoever wrote the ESV is, uh, needs some help, okay? Because that is worded way too confusing for me. So I want you to understand it the way that it should be written. It should be written like this in the original language. Enter through the narrow gate. Why? It's hard, but it's the way that leads to life, and few people find it. Don't enter through the wide gate. That wide gate is easy, and the way leads to destruction. Many people enter the wide gate. Now, that word gate can also mean road. So we would say there's two gates and two roads. 
And we were walking down this path, and we realized that there's a fork in the road. And Yogi Berra always said, whenever you get to a fork in the road, take it. (laughs) I always thought that was funny. Can't do that, man. Can't take both paths, all right? There's only one or the other. Now, Luke says in his version of this verse, you should strive to enter. So that means there's two connotations to this specific passage. Number one, for the doubters of Jesus Christ being the Messiah, this is a judgment call in regards to what will happen if you continually disobey what God has commanded you, namely in regards to salvation. But the second thing is for the disciples, those who have accepted Jesus Christ, and it is in regards to judgment of decision making that has to be made daily. So the whole thing that he says is, number one, yes, obviously, you are going to love unselfishly, but ready for this? It's going to be unpopular. This is so unpopular to do. Jesus says here, this is the unpopular way. Now, the reason it ties together is, so many people believe in the golden rule, but also people believe in the fact that there's two ways. For example, the Quran says there's a way of light and that there's a way of darkness. Other faiths and religions say, actually there is no such thing as other faiths, there's just other religions, okay? We only have faith because faith is a relationship with God, it's not a religion. And so what we realize here is that other people would say, yeah, if you do this, you get this. If you don't do this, you get this. So Jesus is linking the two together because he's saying, Yes, it is going to be unpopular to unselfishly love because you're going to get to this spot in your life where you have to make a choice. Circle that word gate. When you get to that word gate, the audience that heard that word would instantly think about an actual gate. If you ever go to Israel, there's gates in the city. Okay? You have to enter through the gates. There's like a David gate. There's all these other gates that enter into the city. In Hebrews, it's really interesting because it shows us that Jesus died outside the gate. Hebrews uh, specifically, I think it's verse, uh, chapter 13 says, he suffered for the people outside the city gates. It's a symbolic expression of regards to Judaism, which is inside the gates, and people who will believe in Jesus outside the gates. That's another sermon for another day, but it's super interesting to me. All right? <clears throat> So that word gate, they would have understood there's actual gates and there's road that leads up to these gates, these towns, these places. And they're only given access via those who stand at the gate. I always think of the Wizard of Oz when I think about this. You know, as they walk on the yellow brick road, when you're walking on the yellow brick road and they're thinking to themselves, okay, do I go left or do I go right? Everybody has a choice. And here we are reminded of our choice. So let's just say the left is the narrow gate. So look at that word narrow. And here's the crazy thing, and this is where like the epiphany starts to happen to me. That word narrow means thin or poor or wretched. The word narrow means thin or poor or wretched. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are those who suffer for righteousness sake. That word narrow is not just there out of coincidence. That word narrow is there because he is highlighting what he's already said in the Beatitudes. He's highlighting that you are blessed when you take the narrow, poor, wretched road. Jesus says this is the way, a road that is hard. Now ready for this? That word hard, you could circle that in your Bibles, means pressure. There is going to be constant pressure for you as a disciple of Christ internally and externally internally you're constantly going to be thinking do I really need to spend time in my Bible do I really need to pray do I really need to uh, overthink things I overthink everything okay and here Jesus is looking at us he's saying yes you should overthink things you should think about things so much if it's honoring and it's glorifying to me there should be pressure in your life constantly you should be churning on whether or not you did the right thing or the wrong thing you should be because that's validation of the fact that you have faith Okay, it's a narrow road full of pressure. Now, I'm gonna get pushback from people when I do these things. Let me tell you something. When you start loving your spouse, not expecting anything in return, people will look at you and say, what is wrong with you? (laughs) When you start loving your coworkers, not expecting anything in return, people will look at you and they will say, what is wrong with you? You expect nothing in return. This makes no sense. Why are you doing these things? That's pressure, okay? Do not be surprised when pressure comes. Jesus says you shouldn't be surprised at all. My followers are full of these things, okay? He says, because this is a way, ready for this? 
that leads to life. What does the word life mean in the text? Life means vitality, a state of being strong and active. What does Paul say? When I am weak, I am strong. Paul's essentially saying the same thing that Jesus says, where he says, when there is pressure, by taking the narrow, unpopular path, that is where God is pleased the most. He says, when when I overthink, when I evaluate my decisions, when I pray about things, when I pause to study God's word, when I ask, seek, and knock to become more like Christ, I am strong. And he says, this is the way, as Paul will tell Timothy, you are complete. I was thinking about this. When I was a kid, uh, my house connected kind of sort of through this little path uh, to a buddy of mine's house. He lived kind of catty corner to us. You had to go up this little like hill or whatever. And I'll never forget, we went and revisited our our house when I was older. And uh, that path was really long and uh, and very, very, very um, uh, like tight. And then I did it in like 20 steps as an adult. So, uh, irrelevant to the story, but we're going to go back to when I was a kid. So I'll never forget this. If I wanted to go to my friend's house, you never went around the block, okay? You never went to his house that way. You always went through the hard way to get it, and you were always cut up. Like, the branches were there, and everything was there, but you got there faster, and when you got there faster, you could play longer. So it was, it was a huge blessing to take the narrow path, all right? Let me give you a better illustration, because that one was horrible. <laughs> You guys know Craig, right? My, my buddy Craig, he was here a couple weeks ago. Um, he's actually coming back at the end of January. Um, he's going to preach again for me um, in regards to this passage of scripture. Craig hiked the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> I, always, I told him, I said, Craig, you hiked the whole entire Appalachian Trail as an older man. He goes, you just call me old? Yeah. But he took six months of his life, hiked from the start to the end, right? I said, Craig, what was the best part about ending the Appalachian Trail? He's like, you know what? He's like, walking a trail is horrible because you're constantly looking down. He's like, you're trying to figure out like where the next rock is or if there's something that's going to trip you up. And he's like, you just get tired because you're constantly evaluating where you're supposed to go. And you don't want to get lost either. So you're, you know, looking down, looking up, looking down, looking up. He said, but then you get to the end and there's this like kind of big hill, if you will, with a little sign at the top. And if you hike the whole Appalachian Trail, you go to the top of that mount and essentially you get to touch the sign. He's like, you know what, so many people go up there and touch the sign, and they say, look, I hiked the whole Appalachian Trail. He goes, they're fakes. (laughs) I said, but when I walked up there and I touched the sign, I realized that the whole entire journey was worth it. He said, I realized that each and every single one of those steps got me to the place that I needed to go, and it was totally worth it. Even though it was hard, even though it was difficult, it took a long time. I didn't take any shortcuts. It was totally worth it. And that's exactly what Jesus says here. He says, God's people walk a narrow road, enter through a narrow gate. They make hard decisions. They make hard choices every single day to die daily to Jesus Christ so that we can be conformed to the image of his will. It's not easy, but it's always worth it. So for us, when we're reading this passage of scripture as disciples of Jesus, we look at this text and we realize to ourselves, man, it's a daily decision to die to Christ because I've already accepted him as my Lord and Savior. Now, to the doubters, though, the other road that leads to the gate is wide. And that means broad. Some translations will lump in wide and easy together. And what essentially it means is there's room for many people. There's room for a lot of people in this. The easy wide gate is a decision that leads to destruction. What's destruction? Destruction is humanity's worst enemy. Regardless of what any other religion says, it is true that there are two destinations for humanity. There's either an eternity in heaven with God, through faith in Christ, or their separation from God in hell. Proverbs declares to us, it says, there is a way that appears to be right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. There's a way that appears to be right to man. And so many of us understand, because we watch people do this, right? We watch people participate on this. They think that they're on the right way. They think that they're on the right path, but it leads to death. Now, Jesus, he gets tired of us after a while because he's like, I've talked to you in parables and after a while we don't get it. And he's like, I'll just tell you what, I'm just gonna tell you exactly what I mean. So in John chapter uh, 10, he says, ready for this? Ready? I am the gate. Flat out. He just says, I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. And he's talking in regards to this wide gate He said it's not going to be easy to follow God through a relationship with Christ because everything in our sin-cursed existence says take the easy road. But his desire is for us to prosper, not to be in a state of destruction. 
So he says, don't take the easy way. Don't take the wide gate. But yet so many people choose this path. So many people will take it because it's easy. It's easy not to work out. It's easy not to eat right. It's easy to treat people like garbage. It's easy to not have rules and parameters. It's easy to live in a state of anarchy. But what we realize is it's not worth it. Every time we take the easy road, it's not worth it. We were over at uh, mother-in-law's, actually not her house, we were at my sister-in-law's house uh, last night, and they had cake. Oh, cake. When, and when we get to heaven, we're going to eat cake together, okay? It's going to be amazing. It's going to be the best birthday cake that you've ever had. And we're going to eat the whole cake. But Jesus says you can eat the cake when you get to heaven, but you can't eat the whole cake while you're on earth now, all right? And it was so funny. What I did was I ate a piece of cake, and I ate it so fast, and I thought to myself, that was so good. I did such a good job. I should get another piece. <laughs> and I thought to myself, but that's not wise, right? It's not easy to refrain from those things. It's not easy to do that. I get up in the morning sometimes, and I think to myself, oh, I should just sleep in for another four hours. It would be so great, right? Call in sick. I mean, after all, I just call myself. <laughs> But you can't do that, right? That's the easy way. That leads to destruction. It's so easy to look at it and say, man, I'm not going to love that person unconditionally. It's so easy to look at people and say, man, I'm just going to leave them and let them go. It's the easy road. A dear friend of mine and a mentor told me a long time ago, lean into problems because you learn about yourself in the process as well as your relationship with God. You lean into those things because it is hard. Don't take the wide gate believer, but don't take the wide gate doubter because there are only two ways. One's easy, one's hard. There's only two groups. One is small and one is large and there's only two destinations and one gives life and one gives destruction. Don't miss this message. There's no middle road, no middle ground, no middle place. Purgatory is a myth. Why do I know that? How do I know that? Because the Bible tells us so. First John tells us this. This is what God has testified to us. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, but whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. The Bible tells us very clearly, if we do not have life, we have hell. And that is a true reality. And Jesus looks at us, and in the Sermon on the Mount, he gives us a choice. He says, you choose. You choose. It's up to you. Either I'm your Lord and your Savior, I have full authority over your life, or I'm not. You think you're in control, and that will only last for a temporary time period. I have no way to close this message, but I think I might be able to. Let me just tell you this. I think about it in regards to being a dad. I love my girls. They're such good kids. They really are. And I look at my girls all the time, and I tell them that they should love their sister, right? You guys do that with your kids, all of them that you have. You say, you should love your brothers and sisters because they're, they're good to you. We always tell um, the oldest to the youngest, she's the only and best sister you'll ever have. And they look at us and they say, you're not having any more kids? And we're like, no, okay? The Lord would not allow that to happen in our life. <clears throat> and if you are praying that Bethany and I have more kids, I will smite you. <laughs> but here's the, here's the crazy thing we don't say that to them because we don't like them we don't love them we do love them and we know what's best for them and we say you should love your sister because God loves you you should love your parents because God loves you this is your attitude of worship. And I think about uh, Romans chapter 12 where it says, therefore, be living sacrifices, daily, daily dying to yourself so that God would be pleased in all you think, say, and do. Hmm. Interesting. Very hard. I think you know how to apply it though. Let me pray that you do just that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your truth and for what it says. Um, this is a tough passage and tough text. Uh, before we go any further, for those of you who don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible is very clear. I, I do not want to see you heading for that road that leads to hell. And hell's the worst part of hell is just eternal separation from God. And I think sometimes we talk about hell and, and people will say, you just do that to scare us. You know what? It, 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 good. Because this is a very scary place. Think about it like this. If you are living right now 
and you don't have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, believing that his blood that was shed on the cross was for your sins, you are living for the moment in God's grace. And that grace will cease the moment you die or he returns. And that should terrify you. That should petrify you. And understanding these things, knowing we're a sinner and we fall short of the glory of God, it should move us to the acceptance of the fact that Christ came, that he died, and that he rose again, and he did that for you. That Jesus, who is very real, who history affirms, he is not a religion, he is a relationship. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the way to obtain one is not that he is some item to be pulled off the shelf, but he is a Messiah who will restore you back to righteousness. And that comes through faith. That you would confess, humbly submit that you're a sinner and understand that God in his grace gave you his only begotten son, that if you believe, you would be saved. Don't leave this place without trusting Christ. Make him the Lord of your life asking him and you will receive it is very simple if you don't know jesus as your lord and savior it's just saying maybe for the first time in prayer god i believe that you sent your one and only son to die on the cross for my sins i trust you and you alone i know i'm a sinner be lord of my life be my savior and he will if you made that decision man i'd love to talk to you about that and give you affirmation but I know so many of us have made the decision to follow Jesus Christ. We've sung that song and, and we've said, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. And so for us, God, as we walk on the narrow road, hmm, I think some of us want to turn back. Whether that be in relationships, at work, or at home, or with our kids, or with our grandkids, or with just our fellow humans. It's not easy. And so God, I pray that we would be dependent upon you in all things. I pray that you would impress this truth on not just my heart, but the congregation's heart, those who are listening online, those who will listen later, that you would impress this truth upon them to live this out, to be lights in a very dark place, in a very dark world, whether that's for uh, spouses who are having problems loving their significant other or having problems raising kids or in the workplace, whatever that is, God, that you would help us to love unselfishly in a very unpopular way, expecting nothing in return. As a matter of fact, help us to understand that when we do love this way, there's gonna be more pushback. But... Help us to understand that in those actions of unselfish, unpopular love, that is where our joy is complete. That the more we extend, the more we let go. And the more we let go, the more you fill. So may our joy be complete in you as we willingly, obediently love. God, help us, because we cannot do this on our own strength. It is only as Paul prayed to the church in Ephesians through your power. Help us to realize that while unpopular, it is always, always worth it. We thank you, God, for your son and the fact that we can come to you anytime, anywhere, any place. We thank you for your word, which is truth, and we thank you for the opportunity to study it today. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.